Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 204 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. I could not be more thrilled that you are here today. Uh, we are talking to the amazing Vicki Patterson on the show. She is a personal friend of mine. We have been in each other's orbit for, uh, you know, 10 years, um, but we've only really gotten to know each other this last year, and she is a delight. You're going to love listening to her and you've got to go to her writer's YouTube. I routinely get inspiration from her over there. So you can look forward to that. What is going on around here? Well, let's see. I've gotten uh, copy edits on Hush Little Baby back. So I have two weeks to do that. I always think it's going to take like three hours and it never does. Copy editors are always so smart and they say, why did this happen this way? Oh my gosh. She gave me a note that was like, okay, so in chapter nine, she's 39 weeks pregnant. And then a day later, she's 40. But what happened about the 38th week? Because in the 37th week on page, blah, 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 she said she was still six days away from this. They do these things. They ask these really good questions. And then you have to go back and figure things out and make them work. Uh, so copy edits always take longer than I think they will. And I'm trying to be realistic about that. These are not due until Monday. It's Thursday as I record this. I, I better get on it. Actually, I just realized that. Yep. Yep. In my mind, I have been pushing it away as simple again. Gotta stop doing that. We'll work on it after I record this. And let's see. Sorry about there being no show last week. I was trapped in the grips of a migraine that was not good. It was a it was a good uh, five day roller coaster of trying to get out of it, and uh, seriously not fun. So in those moments, I give myself a big old hug and a pass. I hate letting you all down. There are some of you because you've told me you look forward to Fridays and it's part of your schedule to listen. And I am gobsmacked and honored that you would choose to do that. It makes me feel so good. And it makes me feel so bad when I'm not there, when I don't show up. Uh, I was raised to be, you know, if you're not early, you're late. Uh, you need to show up when you say you're going to show up. So sometimes I really, it makes the migraine worse. I'm lying in bed fighting, fighting this guilt. And it's very, it's liberating to just let it go and say, you guys know me. Hopefully you adore me the way I adore you. And you can understand when I'm not around. So thank you for that. Uh, let's see what else. Um, oh, in New Zealand update, a couple of things have happened. First is the best news that our dog Clementine, who basically was dying the last time I talked to you, uh, she had been given this terrible diagnosis that said that she was going to die any minute. We literally put her in hospice and we have this, it's called a care kit, that if she starts to hemorrhage to death, which is um, the hemangiosarcoma that they, sh they sh thought she had inside, uh, is to put her, make her comfortable until the vet can come and put her down at home. Love having that on hand. Love that we are able to put her in this kind of hospice care. She's she's now on really great pain medication. She's a pit bull mix. She's the sweetest dog I've ever met in my life. Uh, but she's a pit bull mix, so she doesn't show pain well. And it wasn't until we got her completely out of pain with this drug cocktail that hospice gave us that we realized, oh my God, you know, Poor girl. Like, look at how much better she feels. Also, the hemangiosarcoma that she they thought she had in her spleen was only a surface hem hemangiosarcoma. It's very hard to say. And her spleen is fine. And her pancreas are doing better. And she's still in kidney disease. But whatever, she could have some more time with us. Here's the thing. New Zealand doesn't take uh, bully breeds at all. You cannot get them in. You can't get them through quarantine. And Clementine is the dog of our heart. We can't we can't leave her behind. I, um, we're going to have to face thinking about how to leave behind our older boy cats. Our boy cats, our, our two brother cats can't make the journey. They're too old and they're too happy with each other. And I wouldn't want to do that to them. So we're going to have to find a new home for them. We're going to have to find a new home for that, uh, little blonde, fur pile that's behind me on the video on the floor. That's Dozy. She's literally the cutest dog anyone's ever seen. And I love her. Uh, but people who have had pets understand this. You have pets that you love with all your heart. And then you have the pet. Every once in a while, you get the pet. 
that is a an animal of your soul. Digit, my cat, was like that. Uh, Harriet, Lala's dog, was like that. Clementine is that for both of us. So with the stay of execution, <laughs> a literal stay of execution, we don't know how long we've got here now. Um, Lala asked at the vet yesterday, so what's the prognosis for this particular dog at this particular time if we keep her out of pain and keep feeding her the good stuff? And, and uh, they said cheerfully, oh, you know, you might get another couple good years out of her. And Lala and I are both thrilled. And at the same time, Allowing us to go to New Zealand was losing her, and that was kind of uh, almost part of the recovery of the heartbreak of knowing we would lose Clementine at any second within the next, you know, day or two or next week. We were thinking about New Zealand, and that was comforting. So, like, it's super, super awesome, and it might be slowing down our um, retreat, which is just fine. It's just fine. Uh, Very excited still to think about New Zealand and think about uh, the health care that we will receive there. We're moving early enough in our lives that if we stay, which is our plan, we will be, we will have paid in enough to have retirement, actual retirement. We are, um, both Lala and I are are grasshoppers. You know, we've, we've always lived rather than saved. So we do have some retirement savings, but it's very, very low compared to most 48 year olds in this country. So, um, Knowing that my taxes in New Zealand can go to taking care of us in our dotage is really exciting. I did um, apply for my New Zealand passport, which I had never gotten around to doing. Just hadn't been something I wanted to spend $150 on. Knowing I had citizenship but not having the passport wasn't a big deal. So I went to their website. I applied for my passport. And New Zealand apologized to me on the website and said, we're so sorry, it might take up to 16 days to get this to you. Is that going to be okay? (laughs) Meanwhile, I had mailed Lala's renewal of her U.S. passport because it had expired. And they're saying, we hope we get this back to you in six months, but no guarantees. Uh, New Zealand not only took those two weeks that they had asked for, those 16 days, they actually got it to me in 10 days. A brand new passport, never had a passport. Citizen who's never had a passport, It shows up in my hand in California, hand delivered from DHL, my new passport. And it's beautiful. It's such a gorgeous passport. It's, it's this, it's got the silver fern on it. It's got all of these um, amazing uh, digital things happening. There's a little clear spot, but if you look through the clear spot, you can almost see my face, like a shadow of my face, as well as the three different other places that are, you know, my face my face bored into this plastic page that is like a computer basically in this passport. Right now it is the most powerful passport in the world. Right now I can get into 129 countries without a visa, which is the strongest there is right now in COVID days. Um, Not that I would ever foist my American body from this germ pool that we are continuing to live in, I would not go to another country. And if we go to New Zealand, we do have to do the two week mandatory quarantine, of course, inside their hotel where they bring you every meal and you pay, you pay through the nose for it and good for them. That's how they keep COVID out of their country. Anyway, I feel like I'm rambling right now, but there has been a lot of, um, back and forth motion and a lot of, a lot of good feelings. Just we're so happy that Clementine feels better and we might get some more time with her. And we're also really happy to be moving forward with this plan, but at a slower pace. We're not trying to get out um, by April, which was what our original time frame was. So um, I'll keep you posted on that. It is very exciting. I'm looking forward to updating you and taking you with us to New Zealand. Will my old accent come back that I had until I was seven? Uh, Probably. It's super annoying. I really hate it because I can hear it in my own voice as soon as I get there or as soon as I talk to a Kiwi. It comes back. It used to come back a lot when I was drinking and a lot when I was really, really tired after being up for like 48 hours at work. Then it would come back. Uh, But since I don't do either of those things anymore, Lala, my wife, doesn't usually hear my New Zealand accent and she mocks me when it comes out. Uh, But it's still there and it wants to come out. So, okay, I also would like to thank a bumper crop of Patreon um, pledges, which make me feel wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much to the people who support on Patreon. You are the reason I get to write those essays that I love 
writing this last essay was about my love affair with my desk and organization. And then I, from there, moved out into the connection that we need in this world. And right now, you and I are connecting. And I think that is pretty special and terrific. So thank you for being here. So thank you also to new patrons at the You Get a Text from Me That You Can Respond Back To level, which is the $3 a month level. Thank you to dear Anne Cherlise. I'm probably saying your last name wrong, but it is beautiful and I appreciate you. For many reasons, Anne, you know why. Uh, Natalie Tyndall, thank you. Tracy Bishop, thank you, thank you so much, y'all. Um, and at the $5 a month level, level where I become your mini coach and I do those mini episodes for you after I collect some questions. Um, I have new patron Sonia. Uh, Sonia, I've never known how to say your last name. Um, Reutz is how I'm going to attempt it. Sonia, you, you are darling. Thank you. And also Shakura Amatula. Beautiful name. Thank you, Shakura. Doug Schneider. Hey, Doug. Oh, it's nice to see you. And Lisa and Jill Ross Nadler. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, everybody. It means the world that you uh, show your support of this show and of those essays in such a hugely important and lovely way. I got to tell you, I say this every once in a while, that um, even the $1 pledges are so welcome and appreciated like from the bottom of my heart. It doesn't matter what level you pledge at. It makes a really true difference in my life. It is something that allows in my budget for us to save for pet emergencies, which is how we were able to say, uh, afford pet hospice, which, oh my God, I wish everyone could use. I wish that our vets that we go to and spend so much money on have the would have the time to talk you through five different medicines that will have very few side effects, but makes a, an animal feel so much better. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So anyway, thank you for the patronage. Really appreciate it. You can always go check that out at Rachel. No, that's wrong. At patreon.com slash Rachel. There's that. Let us jump into this amazing and inspiring interview with my friend Vicky. You will want to leave our conversation and go right I can predict it. And I think that you should find me somewhere online and tell me how you are doing writing-wise. I always love to hear it. I wish you happy writing, my friends, and we'll talk soon. Well, I could not be more pleased, and I'm already giggling, to introduce my friend Vicki Patterson. Hello, Vicki. Hello. Welcome to the show. We were just chatting backstage, as it were, about how thrilled we are to be having this discussion. Let me give you a little bit of an introduction. Vicki Pedersen is a New York Times and USA Today bestseller of 10 traditionally published novels, nine fantasies, and one really mean cat and mouse thriller. And she's a Las Vegas native who worked as a showgirl for a decade in order to pursue her writing goals throughout during the day. I love that. She now hosts an awesome new channel on YouTube for aspiring authors, providing tools, tips, and strategies for a successful career while staying sane. Vicki, I have to tell you, I love your YouTube channel. And when I watch it, I'm like, is she really my friend? She's so cool <laughs> and fun and pretty. I feel like that every single time we talk, every single time I run into you, I'm like, I know her. <laughs> I'm in quarantine. I'm not saying it to anyone but myself. I'm like, I know, I know her. <laughs> I'm so happy to finally know you because we have friends in common, but now we finally connected and I would like to keep you. Ah, my life. There. So. That is what I do. I like to collect and to be collected. So oh, awesome. it works for me. Yeah, we are in, and I will say this because it's not a secret and it's something other writers I think should do. We're in a mastermind together. And that's kind of how we've gotten to know each other is we have this author's mastermind. Have you ever been in a mastermind before? I, I have not, and I was, I am not a joiner by nature, obviously, you know, that's not unsurprising for a writer. And so initially I was like, no, 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 I can't do that. I don't, it's a commitment and, you know, and I'm bad with anything that has to be planned. If yeah. I spring something on me, then I'm like, yeah, let's go do that. I'm super excited about it. But if I have to plan it out for more than a week, I'm like, that's an obligation. So I was, um, worried and then I was like you know what I need to shake things up um I've been alone for you know two decades really doing this gig alone and I think it would be great to have some sort of camaraderie and writing besties and and um 
you know, the, the people in the group are all very, you know, independent and strong and experienced. And I'm like, I had literally nothing to worry about. And it's been so additive, additive to my life. Um, just uh, not just because I love everybody in there, but also because uh, the experiences, uh, I can run things by all of you. And you, I don't have to give so much context, you know, it, you understand where I'm coming from and you can just nail it from the beginning. So especially since I think all of us came in around the same time, I think you were maybe a couple a year or two before me. Um, but we were all coming in around 2008, 2010 into publishing, right? When did you, when did right. you first come out? Yeah. So the first one was out in 07. So 07 oh, okay. 07. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we all kind of have been through this huge sea change. And it and changed our... literally right after or during your, because you came in 0910, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. when everything was changing. Everything under your feet must have felt like quicksand. I know it felt like quicksand under my feet. So Borders closed the week that my second book came out. <laughs> the, the week. <laughs> so I had a book in my first series come out the week that uh, the stock market crashed. <laughs> So oh. the bookstores literally sent it back three days later, gone, remaindered, stripped, everything. And that sunk that series. I was like, yes, that sucked. <laughs> oh, and that's one of those things you cannot predict. And the same thing for COVID, people coming out during COVID. Like, what if it was your very first book coming out right now? I have a friend whose very first book came out on 9-11 in 2002. Like, oh. that literally sold nothing. Nothing. And of course, it, then, then the bean counters uh, counted against her sales. And absolutely, oh, yeah, you didn't you didn't earn out, so therefore you can't sell another book. Yeah, so, so. that's a, that's a, that's what you can't control about this business. I think is the hardest part of this business. Yeah, it makes the writing seem infinitely easier. Yes, I was just going to say that because it is something that it's the only thing I can control is the writing. So speaking of writing, first of all, but let's say it at the top and at the bottom of the episode. Where can we find you on YouTube, your channel? Oh, so it's Vicki Pedersen Author. Uh, you can just Google it because YouTube is a Google search engine and it'll pop right up. Yeah. Perfect. So let's talk about your writing process because I love the way that you talk about writing. You talk about writing the way I want to always talk about writing, which is really enthusiastically, really encouragingly, and to say that, yes, you can do this and it's hard for everybody, um, which, is, which is better to me than every, you know, the people who say, oh, everybody can do this. No, it's hard and it hurts and we have to talk about it. So, Right. Well, I think everybody can do it it's if they have discipline if they're willing to put in the time, if they're willing, if they want it more than anything else in the world, like yeah. for a time there, and I don't think this is forever, but in the beginning, you really need to make it a priority and make it like learning the craft of it, your obsession, right? And then eventually it can join all your other obsessions and it becomes one, one more of those things that you have, you know, like in your toolbox. I'm always talking about a writer's toolbox and how you pull those things out one by one, but well, the, the entire craft, can be become that um, you're always learning and growing and you, you've never arrived because you've never written this particular book before. Uh, but you know, there are some things that you don't have to keep learning again and again and again. I know how to structure a sentence. I know that show don't tell for me comes later in drafts. I suck at that. I, I, I tell so much and my editors are like, this sucks. I'm like, shit, I have to go back and, and get it again. <laughs> the entire book, but that's just a, that's called a draft. So buck up buttercup and do the work. I really love letting editors do their job too. You know? oh. <laughs> me and my, a couple of my, Sophie, who you know, we always say, well, they're getting paid to do this job. Let them do their work rather than trying to send them a perfect draft. Nah, just send it to them. They'll, they'll <laughs> <help>. <laughs> yeah. You do your level best at that time, given your, your constraints, whether it's a deadline or you're dumb I don't know that month I don't know and then and then let it go and, and keep going you know yeah. and and I can almost hear listeners going but I don't have an editor you will have an editor no matter what if you are going to publish a book even, even if you self-publish you will have an editor to help you with this and I think that a lot of the people that I work with forget that they're like I have to make it as perfect as I can and that's all no you're gonna have an editor to help you yeah that's right you, you, you 
like I said, you do your level best, but they they want to help you. That's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. And then also like they, they're not there to change your book. One one thing that or one question yeah. that beginning novelists often have is, are they going to make me change my book? And I'm like, no, it's your book. They're, nobody's going to make you do anything. Uh, but they enhance what's there or they point out, you know, what you think you put on the page that remains in your head. And so uh, I take 98% of I do my too. Editors, Maybe 99. Probably 99.5. Yeah. Let's just keep raising the bar here because <laughs> like I just do it. They're like, this sex, change it. Like, fine. No ego, no ego. Like you can't have an ego when it comes to that stuff because that's why you have that second pair of eyes. And then I just want to say, as far as the way I talk about writing on the channel, I, that is jump cut, cutted. <laughs> that is edited to the to the teeth like I am so good at editing it though it's like so professional it's fun it's storytelling it's in this one of those things that I had to learn I just learned iMovie on my Mac and uh, it took me a couple weeks maybe a month you know not even that long a couple weeks I, I, I just had to take the time for to watch a tutorial and somebody showed me how to do it and then I just did it and now I just I, I take out even breaths so if I take a mm. breath I go as fast as I possibly can. And I try to get as much material on that given subject in a short amount of time because I don't want to waste anybody's time. What's really funny is that I watch everything on YouTube at about 1.5 or 1.75. Oh. And I can't, I can't for you. <laughs> yes, that's my goal. That would be too fast. Okay. Two things. Number one, that's why I do it. And then number two, um, and when you're trying to build a YouTube channel, like I'm trying now because it's relatively new if somebody does that it doesn't count towards your watch time wait what yeah it counts like half the watch time You're so if, no i just i i mean i heard that somewhere it may or may That's not so be true, rude. But it's true i feel bad now because like my brain gets bored if people are slow you're not slow that's you you will never ever i don't think you've ever been boring in your whole life so i will just say that. <laughs> <Not> true, <but. laughs> speaking of speaking of not boring what is your writing process like where and when and how much and how do you get into it all of that um i just cut out the boring parts <laughs> <laughs> that is literally the goal right it's literally the goal no uh well okay so i can give you my ideal but with the caveat that it all oh, it's changes depending on now okay so i've been doing this for two decades i've done it through a birth a divorce a remarriage living in two cities uh, mostly working on airplanes so all of that said you know, it's, it, it changes. Yeah. There are a lot of variables there. However, uh, ideally I'm up early. Uh, I love, what is early for you? Oh gosh. Um, I wish I could get up earlier, but about five thirty. That's nice and early. Yeah. <laughs> and my grandmother used to get up at three in the morning and I was like, grandma, that's the middle of the night. She's like, well, I have so much to do. I was like, what do you have to do? So That's like, perfect. Yeah, so I think I'm turning into her. I keep pushing it back. But when I first started and I was writing uh, my second novel and I had a newborn, I was getting up at 4 a.m., uh, waking myself and hating it but just thinking, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? And that's what I was referring to before. Like in the beginning, you have to be a little obsessive and do that. I don't have to do that anymore because I don't have a newborn. If I did then, you know, yeah, you, so what you have to realize is what's going on with you now is not, it's not always going to be that way, either good or bad, mm -hmm. you know? So you do the very best you can with what you have at that time. So right now um, I get to be in one place. The, the pandemic has limited me to one city. So I'm no longer going back and forth between two different cities every other week. And so I get up at 5.30, 5, 5.30, and I grab my coffee, and I go into this room. It's a new room for me. It's a new space. That's why it's so boring, but I promise you, I'm going to turn it into my YouTube studio, and it's going to be really pretty. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, go, and just a room where I can shut the door. I really uh, have come to found, find that I really love being able to shut that door and it just, my, my mind takes a mental mm. breath, just sighs, releases it. And then I can just take those first hours of the day to, uh, usually I can read, I'll read um, a little bit. 
uh, try to stay away from the news because I don't want that in my mind first thing, um, read some fiction. But generally I will write, uh, not write, um, journal. So mm. I have what's called a working writer's journal. Oh, will you please share this, this incredible idea and people can also go look at your um, website for this. But did I tell you that I've started doing this since you told me about it? No. I'd always kind of kept my morning pages on the side and I did a lot of journaling about writing inside it. Mm-hmm. But you do it a little bit differently and I would love for you to tell us this. Yeah. Well, well, first, the reason I do it differently is because I've done morning pages as well. Julia Cameron's, you know, yeah. the right way and it's a classic and it's wonderful and it works for so many people and it works for me. But I always have that sense of, well, I, I can't read my handwriting. And it's great that I got it out and, you know, it's very meditative for the day, but I can't use any of that now. And I feel like, you know, there's, you know, 1500 words, that are seven, seven to 1500 words. And maybe there was something in there that I could use, you know, because it's in here and it's all connected. So, uh, I actually, I don't know if I, I think I neglected to say this, uh, I had originally heard it somewhere from Sue Grafton, the late Sue Grafton. Oh, I think you said that. I think that was on the video. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, And uh, and so I've augmented it a little bit, but really all you do is you write down the date. So you, and the day. So I'll write down the date and the day. (laughs) And uh, to ground, to ground yourself, right? Um, It sounds silly, but it grounds me. And then I write only no more than two sentences of where I am in that day. so that I know, you know, oh, my child is sick, you know, or I was up in the middle of the night with a toddler, or, you know, I didn't sleep well last night, or I got a great night's sleep. And so mm-hmm. that serves as a record of, so later on, you can go back and see why the writing did or did not go well that day. Yeah, It's not an excuse, but it's really, it's like, all right, give yourself a little bit of a break. You're more than just a writer. You're this fully formed human being. And, and so all of it, all of it counts, right? So it, it kind of records your mental state at the beginning. And then I, I give myself not a story prompt because again, I just feel like prompts are not useless, but I, I really like everything to be applied. If you only have so much time and more importantly, so much mental energy, you really want that to be going into the work, right? Yes. And so I'll give myself a prompt of where I left off in the story yesterday or what I'm thinking about today or the problem that I'm having with this story right now, or if I'm really, really have been on it and, uh, and left myself notes from the day before for a scene, you know, like how to get in and out of it and maybe two or three, you know, how it turns the turning points in that, in that particular scene, then I can start talking about that. And I swear to you, like if I do that and, and I just, melt into it before the morning or before yeah the morning and the day and and the news and you know all of the responsibilities that I have uh get to me I've written you know 700 to a thousand words within 45 minutes before I even open that door again before my coffee has gone cold right it's amazing and so uh, and so then that's a wonderful win and then I'll, I will get up and um, go you know take my child to school if that's what needs to be done or or, or you know just do the morning shuffle I call it brush my teeth <laughs> and then uh, and then come back for three or four hours tops and that's it and so I'd like to leave the afternoon so I can uh, run errands be with family go watch my kid lit play tennis and you know real life I don't work all day. I don't even try to work all day anymore. I don't think it's healthy uh, for me. And, um, and I don't care. Like writing is now, Mm -hmm. writing is now a part of my life. It's not my entire life. Yeah. 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 I love that. And when you're writing about writing, you, do you use Scrivener? I can't remember what you said. I do. I do. And is it just like a, it's like a journal inside that, inside that project? Is that where you keep the, uh uh-huh. So I'll have like, um, um, swerve of the swerve working journal. So, yeah. So it's a record of that time in my life. So you can go back and what's also great is you can go back and see, you know, if you have any uncertainty about where you are in your project, you can go back and and look at your (laughs) previous uncertainty and go, Oh, I've been here before. Well, and that's why I was going to have a question. Do you have the same concerns coming up a lot? I'm sure that that would happen for me. And also I think you said in your video that sometimes you will just be able to lift writing out of the journal and put it into the working 
yeah, that's document, what, right? That's right. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, the 700 to 1,000 words of, you know, all of a sudden, uh, most of the time, um, I'll be writing dialogue, you know, and I'll go zoom, 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 and it'll be dialogue. And then my work, quote unquote, easy work for the day is just like tagging that shit. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. So pretty. That makes me so happy. It gives me chills. I get chills. <laughs> the, time, the times that I've done it, because I've, you know, just been finishing up this book since I've heard this idea, but the same thing has happened. Like I'll be writing about the work, about the work, and suddenly somebody will say something and I'll type out what they say. And then somebody else starts talking and the scene starts happening, even though I was just, I call it skeletoning sometimes when I'm writing about what's going to happen in a scene and it just takes off. It's so fun. It's so fun. And it's like, you're tricking yourself. Cause I didn't tell myself I was going to work on the document. Like I'm just journaling. It's a total trick. It's a total trick because it's not, your document's not open. Right. Your right. book isn't open. You're not working on so that. You're not working. You're just, you're just noodling. You're having a cup of coffee and noodling. I'm having a that. cup of coffee in, in the freshest part of your day when your mind is that it's, you know, oh. at it's freshest and also pretty close to that, you know, sleeping state. Which right? is a great place to approach the page from, I've always believed. Yeah, capture that yeah. magic. Yeah. So what is the biggest challenge you have when it comes to writing? Okay. I, <laughs> this is so vulnerable. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. No, actually, actually, you're going to help me with this because oh. you sent out via your Patreon today um, a, an essay on failure. Oh, yes. Yeah. So learning that failing doesn't mean you're a failure yeah because okay so for example like with that first series and that book being sent back i mean my first series then tanked right i mean i had another book left in it but after that you know the cells are what they are um so failure right uh, my second uh my second series it was a trilogy um, it was only meant to be a trilogy, but I had bigger expectations for it. Um, failure. Uh, my swerve. Best thing I've ever written. Um, a lot of people don't know about it. Failure. You know, so, but failing doesn't mean you are a failure. I really had to separate that. And this is the part of like why I talk on YouTube about being healthy as well, because you are not just a writing machine, you know, you're a person and you need to have all of these aspects in order to you in order to write about anything at all. Yeah. Uh, so, so that has been really hard. I remember, um, uh, I quit writing for a few years in 2015 after my father passed and it was really a travesty because I remember thinking I can't quit because I'll be a quitter, but I couldn't mourn without quitting. So mm -hmm. here I am in one of the most um, eventful, uh, well, one of the biggest events of my entire life, and I felt like I couldn't mourn it. Ugh. Such tragic bullshit. Yeah. It's tragic bullshit. And so I was like, I'm never, ever, ever going to feel that way about writing again. Either it's additive or it's not. It's, you know, it's not gonna be a part of my life. I don't identify that closely with it anymore, and I enjoy it so much more now. <laughs> I love, and I've heard you say that before, that, that it's generative and additive and it needs to be that way. Yeah. And I love that. I lose track of that a lot. I let things start to take away from me. And that's one thing I've learned by, uh, uh, from going full time is learning to identify the dread when I feel it. And if I've got the dread, what does that mean? What do, what do I need to remove? What do I need to excise to get rid of that dread? Um, and it seems like you found it out really the hard way. For sure. Yeah, it was complete and total burnout. And I don't want, I don't think it's necessary. I don't want other writers or other people to have to burn out completely in order to realize that that's not necessary. You know? I hope that people learn from that. I keep seeing people learn really? from burning out, you know? Yeah. And, um, and also just realizing that at sometimes, sometimes in your life, you're going to be writing more and sometimes you're going to be writing less. It's like the ocean, you know, in, in breathing, you know, the ocean doesn't roll in and just keep rolling. I mean, the, the earth would be flooded, right? It, it goes in, it goes out, it comes in, it comes out. Sometimes you have to stop, reset, pause, and then you can resume. But, and again and again. So depending on like those vents, you got your deaths and divorces and marriages and children and and so make space 
for those things as well, because again, that's going to inform your writing and you're going to create new things depending on what you're experiencing. So experience it to the full. I, I honestly, I mean, as horrible as it was, I quit totally when my dad passed. And I remember the day that he passed, I sat in the backyard with my wine <laughs> at like 10 a.m. <laughs> And I felt it. I'm going, I said to myself, I'm going right through the middle on this, right through. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm going to feel every single thing because I, I, I'm not going to let this, you know, back up inside of me. Um, and I feel like everything needs to flow. Like, it it's all so, needs to be flow. It's so good and healthy. And it's, it's not typical, I think. Um, We're so driven as a society by productivity. Yeah. Like you're a success if you're productive. You're a success, and, and I have found success outside of writing. Yeah. And if writing is um, a part of it. That's great. But I just, yeah, I just learned the hard way. You can't put all of your eggs in that basket. It, they will break. Mm, that's a really good answer to the challenge question. What is your biggest joy when it comes to writing? Oh gosh. Uh, well, I mean, there's so many. Otherwise, why would you keep doing it, right? Can I say <laughs> really like a technical thing? I just did a YouTube, I edited a YouTube video this morning that's going to go up tomorrow. Um, I love three-act structure. I love structure. I'm a structure junkie. Me I love too. planning. I love pre-planning. I love brainstorming. I love mind mapping. I love drawing. I love just gathering all of the um, flotsam and jetsam. <laughs> you know, of the story into my mind and just, because it's still perfect. Yes. It's you haven't still screwed potential. Up yeah. It's still potential, right? Yeah. It doesn't, I haven't read it yet. <laughs> <laughs> With all the crappy words. Yeah. I do love that feeling. So you're a plotter then? Such a plotter. Yes. But I have also found, Okay, so this has been interesting. I, I will plot out the whole thing and then I will, I, I got to know the beginning and the end for sure, right? And some tent pole scenes for the three act structure. And then I will get about a hundred pages in, 65 to a hundred in, let's say um, first act done. And then I have to replot the, you know, the second and the third act again. And then I will get um, the first half of the second act done and then I'll have to replot again. And then I will do, the, you know, uh, that's exactly that what sense? I do. That's exactly you what I do. do? Yeah, so I, don't, I don't plot a lot ahead of time. I, I know the tent poles and that's right. just about it. But everything I knew about the tent poles, every time I hit one, yes, it's all out the window and I have to redo everything. Yes. Yeah. So I, I, I've stopped. I used to be uber, uber plotter. You know, I need to know every single scene. And now um, that's a waste of time because I'm going to chunk it anyway. The, the ending never changes. Ever. Oh, you know something else I do that's really weird? Um, I will write, I will get all the way up to the climax, and then I will draft. So it's oh, never- wait, You know what? You broke right there and I really want to hear it. You go all the way up to the end and then what? All the way up to the climax, the climactic scene. Uh -huh. And then I'll either jump over it to the denouement and write that, or I will just not write it and go back to the beginning. That's hilarious. That's exactly what I do. For real? Exactly. And this is what has happened. And the only reason I do it that way now is because I used to spend like an extra month trying to write the ending. Yeah. And then I would just give up, start from the beginning, revise the whole thing, and then I'd know the end. And now I just know that's part of my process. I get to the, that point. I go, I can't do it. I cannot do it. And I, for, for me, I think that I have to get to know those characters with that first big revision. And I've usually put them into such a pickle that if I could easily write those scenes, then I've done the book a disservice anyway. No wonder I can't write it. I put their backs up against the wall and I don't, I don't even know how to fix it until yeah, I've done that I revision. Everything, everything's still too tangled. Yes. Yeah. Um, so for instance, uh, and I'm sure you do this too, um, when you get like a quarter of the way through or halfway through and um, something new pops up and instead of going back, in lieu of going back and rewriting it, you just keep writing as if, you know. Exactly. Right. right. Okay. So then by the time you get to that ending, it's all tangled. It's yes. a mess. And so my brain, I'm like, it doesn't, I always say this, I'm like, it doesn't feel good in my head. Like, it doesn't, I need to untangle all of those threads and, and put everything in its goddamn place. <laughs> in that big second draft. Yeah. Am I like a curse, by the way? Yes, absolutely. That horse has left the barn. <laughs> <laughs> well, clearly. Oh, I don't do that on my YouTube channel. So, but, but yeah. Uh, okay. That's how I do it.
That's it's so funny that we're so similar. Yeah. That's that makes me feel good. I know, me too. Okay, so can you share a craft tip with us of any sort? Craft tip. Um, I mean, okay, so one idea for a book, if you're a beginner and you think, oh, I have this great idea. One idea is not enough. Uh, you need a great idea <laughs> and another actually equally good idea. And then you need to mash those up. And hopefully there's a third idea that you can kind of shove in there. <laughs> like, I don't think it's enough to have a good idea. I, I had an idea about a, you know, a, a, in a PI who went back to solve his own murder. And then I had been uh, writing in paranormal. So obviously that's a paranormal. He was an angel. Okay, so he got an angel, we got a PI. And I'm talking like Dick Tracy. I'm talking like uh, Spencer Tracy and Catherine Hepburn, yeah. like dynamic. I wanted that, but I couldn't figure out. So I had these two really good ideas that I could smash together, but it wasn't working. And so, and sitting at the desk all day long was not helping me. So one day I was out running errands and I went to, uh, do you know the story? No. Oh, okay. So one day I was out running errands and I, uh, I was going to Trader Joe's and there was a, a, a hair salon, one of those cheap, you know, super cuts or whatever it is right next door. And again, like, I don't like making plans. And so I won't, I won't look at my hair. This is sad. So I won't, but I'll walk in. And so I walked in and there was a guy I'd never seen before, never met. And I handed over my hair to the person. <laughs> and, but I walked in and he was where I had this full sleeve of tattoos and, you know, uh, cherries and doves. And um, he had, he was wearing a guayabara and he had cigarettes rolled up in his sleeve and cuffed jeans. And I'm like, and pomade in his hair. And I'm like, what wow. are you? I was like, what are you? What, what is this? And he's like, I'm rockabilly. My girlfriend and I lead a full on rockabilly lifestyle. And they were, and I was like, tell me more. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. And so there was my love interest, a modern day reporter, rockabilly girl who could not only understand this guy from the fifties, but like idealized yes. and loved him and then he would love her. I know I get chills again. And so I walked out with my really good idea, which was really three ideas and a really lopsided haircut. <laughs> <laughs> I will say the last time I ever went to a Supercuts, I, I ended up crying for like four months. It was so bad. <laughs> I <can> see that. <laughs> <laughs> but that is amazing. And I love that because I really feel like a lot of us, when we start books, we have that one good idea and more starts to come to us. Um, and I always feel like it's a product of our obsessions too. Like, and there's that feeling that, you, and I don't know if you had this, but there's that feeling like, well, maybe my next book will be about rockabilly people. And there's that feeling to push it away. Like, oh, I got to save it. I could save that for something else. And my answer to that is never save anything. Never save anything. Because you, by using it, you make room to fill up with more experience and more, just more. And it always backfills. It always, yeah. there's always new stuff rising to the surface if you are using what you're given by walking into supercuts. <laughs> you won't be able to write fast enough. Oh, that's gorgeous. No, I love that story. Thanks, Trader Joe's, for yes. having, for having that place <laughs> next door. <laughs> Oh, goodness. All right. So um, what thing in your life affects your writing in a surprising way? Okay. I don't like this answer. You won't like this answer. Nobody likes this answer. I can't wait. Exercise? Ugh. I, I know. Went, I went for a run this morning and it felt really good. And I haven't been for a run oh, in like two years. I hate that. <sighs> it, changed, it makes everything better. I know. And so you feel better afterwards like writing. Um, you learn about perseverance, like writing. You have to keep going in just one more step, one more word when you don't want to, like writing. Um, yoga will teach me, you know, to stay in the pose. You know, you know, you, you're, you're stuck. In, like, I'm not downward dog, because that's fun, but like, you're stuck in triangle pose, and you're like, get me out of here. And, and if you're in a class, no, you won't... Is, no. Right. And, if, and that's what I miss about going to classes because I'm stubborn and if someone else can see me yeah. and it hurts, I'll stay in it all day. But at home, I'm like, oh, maybe I could get out of this pose. Me too. Yes. Um, oh, so that teaches you about, well, breathing through it, right? Sticking with it. Uh, when I ride, 
a bike. I, I pretend that I'm in the Tour de France. I'm like, I'm the only woman ever to be in the men's Tour de France. And like, <laughs> because there's something about my body that is just special. And like, I, you know, like Simone Biles, like there, she has an extra gear. That's me as a woman in the t- Tour de France. And they're, and they're, oh, you're going so fast that you can't even see any of the other yeah, men. The guys are like, and like, they're just so upset because I'm like riding and yeah. And then the music gets, you know, more in my ear. And I, I and I, so it teaches me about imagination <laughs> and, and oh, that I'm a little bit of a moron, but that's okay. <laughs> that's, so it's yoga but, and biking. Any other thing that you do? Yeah. Well, I don't run anymore because it hurts. And so, um, what else do I do? Um, I used to play tennis. I don't do that because my, um, child can now beat me. So that's not <laughs> fun. Uh, <laughs> super competitive. Um, yeah, competitive, anything, air hockey, I'll do that. I'll just, <laughs> but I like shake the whole table and yell and scream and I throw the paddle at my husband's head and like, it's very, very active. Yeah. And yeah. actually even writing is an active process for me. So like when I'm revising, I, I'll print out a scene and then I'll put it, um, spread it out on a, a high countertop and I'll pace, I'll walk between it, I'll make notes, I'll go over here and then, oh, interesting. then I can go and sit back down and, you know, key it in. But I need, I don't know, it's active, I'm up, I'm down, I'm moving. It's so um, healthy. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm cursing. <laughs> <laughs> so healthy. I don't, it's not really mentally healthy, but yeah, just movement, movement, movement seems to help. So that's my terrible answer <laughs> no i think it's a great answer it's a, and it's one that i i think i would hear more often but i don't know if i've ever heard it on the show so good i'm <laughs> glad you said it what is the best thing you've read recently oh um i'm reading a lot of ya i buy so many ya books i'm like here my child is for you and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> for me it's so much fun um so i read maggie steve otter's uh the scorpio races how you say say her name? I never knew that. How was it? I haven't read her in a while. Oh, has, but you have read her before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she's lyrical and magical, yeah. and uh, a writer. She's just writing at the top of her craft, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's awesome. It's so mm-hmm. awesome. It's set on this fictional island where every November there's this brutal race. Uh, that these people race water horses, but they're deadly water horses. They take, you know, they eat uh, flesh. And they uh, they try to bite the other horses and the other racers, but you know it's a lot of money. So um, the two protagonists, it's like dueling protect, not dueling, uh, alternating <laughs> dueling, <laughs> alternating protagonists, uh, both first person, and um, obviously they're the love interest, and they do uh, fall in love, but they both have their own agency, and you want both of them to win, and they can't, and therein lies the tension. That's perfect. It's masterful. Is She's it? Masterful. Is it a beginning of a series, or is it a standalone? It's a standalone. So but you can just get obsessed and knock, knock right through it. Yeah. I'm going to put that to the top on my TBR pal because I haven't read her in a while. And she's no. so good. She's so good. And she's like, I feel like she's too, like, I want to be friends with her, but she's too cool. Like she's kind of like tough and like a, a um, uh, tomboy. And um, she has her own tarot deck, you know? Her own tarot deck. She plays the bagpipes. She's <laughs> an artist. I didn't know that. Yeah. She's a fantastic artist. Uh, what else? Oh, she um, builds and drives muscle cars. I mean, like she's insanely cool. She's very like singular. And mm. I always wish I were that singular. I, I don't feel like I'm. I think you are, Vicky. I think you, think you are. I don't I do. feel like I'm that singular. I, I think like... that listeners should go check you out and, and then oh. they will know how singular you are, which is amazing. So tell everybody where you can be found. Well, um, I hope you do come and check me out over on YouTube because that, what I'm really trying to do there is build a conversation and a community. And like, if you have questions or if comments or anything, you know, if you want me to make a video on something just for you, I will do that. Uh, it's, it's fun. It's another form of storytelling, but it's short form. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's very fast and, um, and I get a nice adrenaline hit and it's, and you're so engaging. You're so engaging and you're so smart about everything that you're saying. Oh gosh, thank you. <sighs> from you, that is an amazing compliment. I just think I'm so happy that we've met and um, we're in a mastermind together because then I can pretend your mind is my mind. And <laughs> I can share all of that. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. So where's your where's your um website? Is it Vicky Peterson? Yeah, VickyPeterson.com. It's just sitting there, you know. Two T's and two S's. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on the show. 
My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, everybody.